Well, thank you very much, Dr. Langerman. I really appreciate it. And I'm really honored to have this opportunity to be able to talk to you and the faculty and um, what amazing presentations today by the residents. So thank you very much. Um, this really is going to be a, a story about a journey from being a clinician scientist to CEO of True Angle. And I'll start with potentially what is one of the most important slides in this, which is my conflict of interest slide um, that discloses that I'm director of research at RSM and professor in the Faculty of Rehab Medicine, but also most importantly, um, founder and shareholder in True Angle. And as I go through this, you'll understand why this is an important slide. Um, so really my aim is to focus this lecture on how I decided to make this leap from academia into entrepreneurship. And in order for you to understand that, I need to give you a bit of history around how it all came to be. So I spent the majority of my academic career at RSM, which is an institute that's housed within the University of Alberta and within a couple of our hospital systems. Now the focus at RSM is around reconstruction and rehabilitation of defects of the head and neck with a really strong focus on digital technologies, especially surgical design and simulation. So just as an example, um, 20 years ago, we established a 3D printing lab within the hospital. And at the time, people thought we were a little crazy. But it was um, uh, why this is important is that it's really an innovative place. And I think that if you have the opportunity to be nested within some innovative institutions, um, it leads to really great things. So. We were heavily focused on outcomes and understanding the impacts of our interventions at different points in time. Um, specifically for me, my focus was on functional outcomes. So this included speech, chewing, swallowing, and quality of life. And um, to take you back even a little further into history, because it's relevant, uh, my father was in the hospitality industry and he was an entrepreneur. He started a chain of restaurants. And when he retired, he had 600 employees and 20 restaurants. So needless to say, I grew up in restaurants. And so I had the benefit of always being around food, always watching people enjoy food, coming together around food, celebrating with food. And when I went into my clinician research position at RSM, what I saw was exactly the opposite. So out of all those things that I was assessing, swallowing and dysphagia became really important to me because what I saw, people stopped enjoying food, their social lives fell apart and really their quality of life was destroyed. And what I heard from them was that dysphagia changed their life completely and it was terrifying and depressing. So what I could say to them was that we could help them. We knew that if we could get them into intensive exercise, that we could change this for many of them. But the problem was that the equipment that was necessary for the kind of treatment that we wanted to provide was really bulky, awkward. It's this huge thing that was in my lab. It required that patients would come in for intensive therapy. And so it just never really got done. So this is where my clinical academic career started to change course. And um, what I knew was that there had to be a better way to get this clinical treatment into the hands of patients. So we applied for funding. We were um, fortunate to get uh, funding from the Alberta Cancer Foundation for five years. They funded us for $2 million to take us from the beginning of this journey right to the end. So in other words, the end was commercialization. So in that grant, we had to talk about how we were going to commercialize it. And it's funny to look back now because we spent about a paragraph on the commercialization side of it and said something to the effect of, yeah, we're going to license this to an industry partner. And um, little did I know that things aren't that simple. So we did end up creating a solution. It's small, portable. It answers the pain point that we had years ago, um, which was how do we get this into the hands of our patients? They can now use it at home. They can complete their exercises at home. Clinicians can monitor them remotely and understand how the patients are doing and if they're adhering to their exercises. And so that was a 10-year journey kind of compressed into two minutes. But what I want to talk about are a couple of points of inflection on that journey that were really important with respect to making that leap into entrepreneurship. Because 
as a clinician scientist, if you decide to do this, you have to know it's going to change your life completely. Um, so if you remember, I said we had to write in a commercialization plan. And the funders about halfway through started getting very serious about what is that commercialization plan. Um, they wanted quarterly reports from us. And really, when they first started asking about this, um, our, for us, it felt like, what do you mean? What are we doing about commercialization? You know, we're still doing research. And by the way, look at the results we're getting. They're really great. Um, but it certainly put us in this really uncomfortable position. There was this undercurrent where it was like, we knew that there was something that we had to do that we didn't necessarily know how to do. So it was uncomfortable because it was really foreign to us. But there were these things that kept pushing us along that path. Um, so the next thing were our patents. So we had been getting funding um, from the university. It was small, but through the commercialization office, the tech transfer office, um, but that was ending. And we also knew that we couldn't use all that lovely research money that we got for patents. So it was either gonna come out of pocket 100% or we would have to find a way to supplement that. So we did find commercialization grants, but the issue with that is you have to have a business in order to get a commercialization grant. So at this point, there was really a decision that I had to make. It was, am I going to license this or am I going to spin out a company? And based on everything we had been learning, I decided it was we had to spin out a company to make this happen. So I incorporated a business and I started writing grants for business funding and I put some of my own money into as matching. Um, and then it was like, okay, so who's going to run this company? So I really thought that I needed an MBA who could run it. Um, and what I found, I did bring someone in, but what I found was that actually I was doing a lot of the writing of the business plan, the financials and everything else in between. And there was a question to me, which was, if I'm doing most of this, why am I not just doing it? And a little bit more about my history that I didn't mention was, after every degree I did, I always had this thing in my head, um, I should do an MBA, I should do an MBA. So I'd grown up in this entrepreneurial family, and that was in my blood. So, so things between commercialization and academia started colliding for me, essentially. So that brings me to the point of, okay, how, how did we get from here to there? And um, back to the question, why am I just not doing it? So to me, this is what it felt like. I was standing on one side of things, which was academia, and there was this wider market that I could get this amazing innovation out to, but it was across this humongous valley. And in my head, it was like, what the heck? How am I supposed to get over there? And when I was on the academic side, I was really comfortable. I knew how to build a lab. I knew how to get grants. I knew how to publish. And I knew all the things I needed to do to be good at my job but I didn't know anything about going to market. And so what became really important, and I heard a couple of you talk about this today, was that um, you found accelerators. And I can't tell you to find the right accelerator for you where you are, how important it is. So we uh, were part of the Creative Destruction Lab. It's one of the preeminent accelerators for business development. It's a nine month program. Every six weeks, you have to hit some targets. Otherwise, you get kicked off the island. Um, every six weeks, you're put in front of a room of about 200 people. So it's like Shark Tank on steroids. And um, there's investors and, and mentors in there. And they, they vote on whether you should stay or not. But what that did was it really taught us how what we needed to think about as a company. So after that, we raised money. And we got involved with another accelerator, the Matter Health Accelerator out of Chicago, and then um, again went on to launch. And as we kept going, the journey continued. And really, I refer to it here as a marathon because um, it really is. Things don't happen overnight. So that patent that pushed me into starting the company in 2017 finally issued five years later. And one other thing um, that was really important was that it doesn't happen without a great team. So part of making the decision to move into entrepreneurship was knowing that I had a team behind me um, who believed in this, and especially uh, my co-founders, Gabby and Dylan. So I'm just going to check the time here. Okay. 
Um, so now let's talk about the, the straddle between academia and entrepreneurship and some of the things that um, go into this. And when I was presenting earlier this year in Austin, I had made a comment to the audience about um, that I had crossed over to the dark side. So this was an audience um, of uh, surgeons and prosthodontists who had known me for many years. And what we talked about there was that we really needed to stop thinking about commercialization and commercialization activities as the dark side, even though, as um, Dr. Langerman <laughs> noted, I've written a book about research fraud and medical misconduct and its relationship to business. And just to note, I wrote that <laughs> before I even had an inkling that this would be part of my journey. So um, anyhow, the dark side, I think that the reality, there is a reality around commercialization being seen as this. So as an example, I was invited to um, speak on a panel about the future of technology and dysphagia rehabilitation. And then I was uninvited because of the commercial interest, even with full disclosure, it was just it felt too risky for them to have me sitting up there. And what I think is that actually with commercialization, we're heading into the light because I think that these technologies that we're developing, um, a lot of these digital technologies, they're bringing to us real world evidence. And um, so I think that we're at the point where commercialization has the ability to advance healthcare actually more quickly than some of our traditional um, research that happens in the lab. So four things that I'm going to touch on briefly that have been related to this straddle are number one, IP and licensing. So when we first were starting this at the university, we were working hand in hand with our tech transfer office filing patents, looking for a larger company to license this. Then I made this decision to establish the company. And now I was licensing the technology back into my company. And when it was time to get investment from investors, they didn't like the deal. They didn't feel it was investor friendly. So I'll never forget the call that I made to the tech transfer office to talk to the person that I'd been talking to for years to tell them, hey, I've got investors, but they don't like this licensing deal. And the response was, well, Jana, we're sitting on opposite sides of the table now, so I can't talk to you about this. And it was like, oh my God, right, we are. I hadn't thought of that, so okay. But the great thing about it was that what I was able to do was to broker a conversation between investors and the university. They happened to be at a point, the university was at a point where they wanted to be more friendly towards commercialization and they knew that they had to make some changes. Um, the second thing is investment and funding. This whole thing will change. So first of all, you're gonna need investors if you are gonna commercialize say, commercialize something. Um, you'll need angels and VCs, but there's also these commercialization grants that are available and they're great to take advantage of um, because one of the things that happens is some of the conventional research funders who used to like funding you also are not that thrilled about funding you when there's a commercial interest because of the perceived conflict of interest. Um, so there's that. The what you're also so now you're taking your skills at writing grants for research and you're writing them for a business, which has to have a commercialization slant on it. But I see that as a good thing many times. It's because you get to the point pretty quickly about what you're going to do and why you're doing it. The where part is interesting because the money comes into a company from these commercialization grants and not the university. Now, this is important as an academic because what we're judged on every year for um, salary, et cetera, and our, our, our contribution to the university are things like grant funding, publications, et cetera. So even though I've raised over a million dollars in non-dilutive funding for the company, that doesn't show up at the university. So um, there's no recognition of that. And the, the university hasn't bridged that yet in their commercialization efforts. So as an academic, it becomes an issue for me because it looks like I've not really been doing very much. Um, then there's ethics. And um, this is another big thing. I went from being the chair of the ethics board and the health research ethics board, getting grant or um, research approved in one to two months, which was really normal, to now having it take a year for approval for very simple research because there was a company interest and um, the board didn't know how to handle it. So 
um, what it does is it forces, it's forced me to look at arm's length research for clinical research and really to refocus my own research within the company on engineering. And then last but not least, quality and regulatory. Um, this is a whole different ball game than keeping a lab notebook, documenting iterations and just kind of freewheeling it inside your lab. Um, you know, this is really about having um, a quality system, having detailed design specs, change documentation, clearly laid out processes that you have to follow when you have a medical device. So that has changed as well. Now, having said all this and in conclusion, um, I wouldn't change a bit of this for the world. I think it's been one of the greatest opportunities of my career. And I can't tell you how exciting it is to be able to see what the thing that you're so passionate about get out into the world and get into the hands of other folks around the world. So thank you, Dr. Langman, for this opportunity uh, to share this journey and um, just to be with you today on this very special um, inaugural Haynes Scholarship Day. Thank you, Jenna. And I couldn't imagine a, a better, oh, yes, let's clap. Let's see. You hear the clap in the room, right? Thanks. She's <laughs> probably over a room camera so you can see the people. Um, so uh, amazing talk, and, and this is a fitting uh, wrap up uh, to this. Uh, I, you know, I just want to uh, peek you in that I've gotten several comments uh, uh, that that this is 100% the sort of commentary that we need to hear as, as, as physicians thinking about this. And uh, it, it is uh, something that I've struggled with. Anybody who's trying to, you know, both develop the sort of loving kind of like warm hug of academia and like develop these neat things and be in that innovative environment and then sort of go out to the, what I always thought was kind of the cold, dark world of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's true a little bit, although there's actually a really amazing warm community in the entrepreneurship community too. Um, as far as what I was really struck by uh, and, and uh, impressed by is this idea of, you know, you thought you, many, many uh, uh, researchers, entrepreneurs who come out of academia do rely on, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hire a business partner. I'm going to hire somebody to sort of run the company. Um, and I know you have like a, you know, your family background, it's a beautiful story. I'm wondering, um, how else did you sort of skill up? What were the key mentors that you had for that? Uh, other than maybe that MBA that you mentioned that, you know, was, was, was part of it, but, um, yeah. Yeah. The key mentors were folks who were in the accelerator. So, and that's why I say pick an accelerator carefully because we had within that very high caliber mentors who had all been there and done that. So they were folks who had started companies, exited companies within different sectors. So health, energy, ag, and even the energy and ag guys were still our mentors because they had um, uh, on these teams that we rotated through because they had something, uh, a perspective that was really important to provide to us as well. Um, and then focusing in on the matter health accelerator was really important because again, there now you're focused solely on health, um, different kind of mentorship, uh, folks who had been there within the US system. So I think that um, uh, those were really important experiences for us and for growing and learning what we needed to learn. Um, we've also, we have a, a board of advisors in the company and I meet with them on a weekly basis. Um, you know, that's really important. And I think one of the comments that we've had is that we were mentorable. And I think you have to be that. You have to be willing to hear the crappy stuff that you don't want to hear that maybe you're not doing right or that you think should be done another way and open your mind to something that someone who's been there and knows knows it um, uh, is telling you. So it's always fun. Uh, Jenna, that was fantastic. Can you maybe speak a little to uh, how going through this has um, uh, made you better as an academic because I'm, I'm sure it has uh, you know perhaps improved your grants and whatnot um, but speak to how the entrepreneurship sort of gave back to that part of your career yeah I would say what it what it's really done is this hyper focus on what you're doing as far as research goes like back to that point of doing research for the sake of an outcome not research just for the sake of research which Let's be honest, sometimes in academia, we do, we have these projects running because 
we have to get papers, we have to get all these other things, we have to get students through our lab. And I just made the commitment that if I'm taking a student on, you're working on this, like you're working on some aspect of this technology to make it better for the patients who we serve, whether that's a machine learning model, whether that's a new um, group of patients like Parkinson's patients, but this is what we're doing and I'm not gonna do these little sidebar <laughs> um, research projects. So I think it's made me better in that way. And I think the other thing it makes you better in is you have to sell a product and you have to learn how to sell your research. And I think for funding and research applications, that's made me better at, again, getting to the point of what is the real impact of this research that we're doing? So 